Okay, back to the dinam of uh, the wedding. Yesterday we discussed that the proper way of making a kinyan, the way the witnesses make a kinyan from the person, is not that the rabbi does it. The best halachic way is the witnesses themselves pick up the handkerchief or the pen or the gartel, whatever it may be, a vessel, a keili, that the chosen, by picking it up, is legally binding himself to everything which is mentioned in the ksuba. Now, a very important thing that needs to, that was mentioned, I forgot to mention it, and that is, a chopa must have a minion. No minion, no chopa. Okay? A funeral, God forbid, doesn't need a minion. Don't need, you don't have a minion, you can't say Kaddish. But to bury somebody in the ground, you don't need a minion. But to, I mean, to marry somebody in a chopa, so over there you do need a minion. The chosen is counted as one of the ten. Now, sometimes people have, let's say, um, kosher weddings, or not so kosher weddings, and then they, the ksuba got lost, the ksuba was mistaken, or the kedushin wasn't valid, they didn't have valid witnesses for the kedushin. Because, like the Rambam says in today's Rambam, in order for witnesses to be kosher witnesses, they have to be completely religious, not even transgressing biblical prohibitions makes them biblically forbidden. Rabbinic prohibitions make them rabbinically prohibited to be witnesses. Relatives are not kosher to be witnesses. You can have the most holy, the holiest Moshe and Aaron. They are not allowed to be witnesses on the ksuba. If somebody has a ksuba with Moshe and Aaron on it, it's a not kosher ksuba. Why? Because the ksuba is, needs two kosher witnesses and relatives are not allowed to be kosher witnesses. What? What does Halakha define kosher witness? I mean, you have someone who is not Shomer Shabbat for six months and then he becomes Shomer Shabbat. And then, so six months later, he's going to keep Shabbat for six months. He's considered... Then he's about Shuva. Then, in other words, like this. When it comes to testimony of witnesses, the Torah says, Lies, Lysia, Eid, Russia, whatever. Eid, Russia, I remember the exact passage now. But the Torah clearly says, a Russia cannot be a witness. What's the definition of Russia? So we know that even somebody who not only gets capital punishment, somebody who, let's say, eats Chazer and gets Malchus, lashes, the Torah says, Vahayim bin HaKaysa, Russia. The Torah calls him a Russia. And the Torah says, a Russia cannot be a witness. Now, obviously, if somebody did tshuva, then he's about tshuva. Or there's another interesting, something just mentioned here. What happens, somebody was a relative, and then they became, let's say, two brothers-in-law, yeah? Two guys married two sisters. So brothers-in-law are relatives. They cannot be witnesses, Right? What happens if one guy divorced the sister? So they're not brothers-in-law anymore. If they're not brothers-in-law anymore, he technically could testify because he's not related anymore. Okay? But they have a chuppah. You need to have a minion of people. The chosen and the rabbi, it's all part of that uh, minion. One second. Now... There's, there's a rule in halacha, this is very important to understand, not only in Ksuba, but in many laws also. Predated documents are not kosher. Predated documents are not kosher. Post dated documents, but the other are kosher. Why are predated documents not kosher? So I'll give you a simple example. Let's say uh, on June 1st, I'll lend you $1,000. So we learned in the Gemara that when I lend you $1,000, there's a lien on your property for me. There's a lien on the borrower's property for the lender. If the lender has no money when he comes to collect the debt, he can go to any field bought after the time of the loan, because the sellers, I mean the buyers were supposed to check into it if there was a lien on the property or not. 
So therefore, he can go to any land that was sold after June 1st and, and collect the money, collect the field. But what happened if the loan took place June 1st, <coughs> but they predated it January 1st? So six months early, they already wrote the date. Now, which means, when did the loan, when did the bond, when did the lien happen? On June 1st. What document, what does the lien say in the document? January 1st. That means there's a lien six months before the actual loan took place. So then the buyers that bought a field in February, March, April, when there was really no lien on the property because there was no loan yet, but the fact that the document says January 1st, they're gonna be able to go collect that property, right? So a predated document is no good. Therefore the Ksuba is also a document. What's the document? Like we learned in the Gemara Ksubis, the financial responsibilities of the husband to the wife. And if, God forbid, there's death or divorce, she can collect the Ksuba from the estate. Not if there's no estate left. They're allowed to go to the buyers after the, ta the date of the Ksuba and collect any field that was bought after the date of the Ksuba. Right? That makes very simple sense. So therefore, you can't have a predated ksuba. <laughs> Chabad has a very interesting custom that most people in the world agree, don't agree with, but that's, as we say, the Rebbe writes is their problem. What happens winter time? Yeah. The chuppah is many times at night already. Right? Let's say today it is your test. So the chuppah will be, let's say it will be a winter day, yeah? So the chuppah would be, uh, what's today? Monday night. Monday night is already chaf. <coughs> but our minig is to write your test and the ksuba. But I'll tell you why it's not predated. Even though the wedding is going to take place on the 20th. Because predated means when the lien is predated. If a husband and wife signed the Ksuba this afternoon, Monday afternoon, which is the 19th of, uh, well, you can't get married anyway, but the 19th of Thomas, right? So the fact that they made a Kenyan with the Chassan and the Kenyan with the Chassan, the picking up of the handkerchief, is the same date that it says in the Ksuba, it doesn't matter that the Chupa is later because the chupa and the ksuba are two definitely uh, liens. The ksuba is one lien and the chupa is one. The chupa is a chassan can legally bind himself to the properties for the kala before the chupa even. Even a few days. So Chabad custom is dafke, usually, I mean, <laughs> that doesn't always work out that way, that if the wedding is Monday night, we try to make the wed the ksuba <coughs> written Monday day. If not, you write it Monday night. It's not a big deal. But this is what the Rebbe writes. I'm in against to write the ksuba during the day. What did you want? There's certain relatives that the Ramam says, version, there's it's called Rishim Berishim, first and first, second and second, third and third. Okay? That means two brothers are first and first. Their kids are second and second. Their kids are third and third. Correct? A father and his own son is first and first. So the brown but the Yevid second cousins would be fine. Even though Halacha says when it comes to witnesses, we try to avoid even a distant relatives. But technically, for instance, brothers-in-law cannot be kosher witnesses. First cousins cannot be kosher witnesses under a chuppah or any time. For anything, they can't be kosher witnesses. Um... 
uncles and nephews cannot be kosher witnesses. You know, any type of close relative is forbidden biblically. It's not a kosher wedding. It's not a kosher document. One of the ways, one of the ways that in today's world, there's a, we'll talk about it for a few minutes. There's a very big problem. You know, in Europe, they were, the guys in the show told me, the European show, the guys in the show told me that even in Europe, the Jews that were not religious did three things according to Torah. Birth, meaning bris, marriage, and burial. This, even if they weren't religious at all, not Shema Shabbat, nothing. They would do, in Europe, they would do bris, kosher, kosher moil, marriage, a kosher ceremony, and the burial, a kosher ceremony. Hatch, match, and dispatch. Hatch, match, and dispatch, correct. Those are the three things that even the, not, the I remember the Kreitenberg, those, those people from Shul told me years ago that that was the unspoken language that the people said. Today, for better or worse, not classifying people, you have people that are not actually <laughs> religious doing weddings, and therefore the witnesses they choose to use are not kosher. Because the national Meshabbat, many times they have relatives doing it, brothers, cousins, whatever it is, they're not religious. So then the problem, it's good and it's bad. It's good and it's bad. It's bad is because, you know, you still don't have a kosher chuppah. I mean, you're still married, everything. But what happens if later on in life, this couple obviously is not religious, decides to divorce. Now, they're not religious, <coughs> so they won't necessarily get a kosher get. Excuse the pun. They're not going to get a kosher get. And they're going to go marry somebody else. Correct? Now, the, if they didn't get a kosher get, is this ma woman who was married to this first guy, she considered a married woman, Aisha Sish, that who's now living with another guy that's going to make a mamzer? And Aisha Sish and all of that. So this is the advantage of non-religious weddings. There's an assumption that if it's a non-religious rabbi officiating, the chances of him having kosher witnesses are minimal. So therefore, even though you try to check out, you look at the videos, who are the witnesses, so on and so forth, but the bottom line is, many times, you won't have kosher witnesses. So then, one second. So then, the wedding wasn't a real wedding. The chatchila, they would need to get a proper get. But with the Yevet, because they didn't have two kosher witnesses, and they didn't live in a religious neighborhood, where people saw them walking into the house as husband and wife, they didn't have an association <coughs> with religious people. So then, what happens? That wedding, the rabbis later on rule, was never a kosher wedding. If it was never a kosher wedding, so then the woman didn't biblically need a get. The fact that she married somebody else is not a problem because then the guy's not a mamzer. Well, well, so they're living together as, as uh, so? They're not bastards by it, they're not a mamzer by it. What? The handkerchief is a form of acquisition. Because the Torah learns out from a puzzle, it has to be an article that you exchange. I give you, you bind yourself to me. You give it to the chosen. He picks it up, means he acquires it. So now by you giving him the handkerchief, he's giving himself to the lean of the ksubah.